Greetings. Welcome back. We've been taking a look at um, a couple of chapters here on economic geography. Uh, this uh, time around, we're going to be taking a look at um, economic geography, um, more of the blue collar uh, end of it, I suppose, if you will. And uh, next time, we'll be looking at uh, white collar types of uh, economic geography. And uh, this chapter here, we're going to evaluate the economic decisions made by corporations. Uh, we're going to differentiate between the major economic systems and recognize some of the logic in early economic theory. And we're going to be doing that too uh, with uh, the next chapter as well. Some interesting economic theories that uh, might seem a little primitive today, but uh, I think you'll find them interesting. Nevertheless, some of the major heads-up terms for uh, this particular chapter would be primary activities. Primary activities, that's where you're extracting materials right from the earth. Manufact secondary activities, or what we know as, um, we call it manufacturing activities, uh, that's where you're adding some kind of form to you know, what you extracted from the earth. We'll get a little more specific and large on that in a few moments when we get into the, uh, the lecture model. Tertiary activities, probably a $64 way word or way of saying um, service industries, right? We're familiar with serv the service industries and many of us work in those. Uh, let me see, what else we're going to take a look at in this um, sec Free markets. So we're taking a look at free markets. Free markets are, you know, for profits, right? For profits, private sector, you know, little regulation, right? Uh, subsistence economies, these are economies where people are basically wor uh, working for local needs. Eh, they operate for, you know, off of some profit, but uh, not a lot. Local needs, uh, family needs, so forth. You see this primarily in developing countries and third world nations. Uh, planned economies, Think of your forms of communism, maybe some of your more extreme forms of socialism, uh, where um, everything's top down, right? Economic decisions are made by <clears throat> by the government. We're going to be taking a look at a couple of uh, different types of agriculture: intensive subsistence and extensive subsistence. If subsistence agriculture is for local needs and uh, not doesn't really lean a lot on profits. Intensive subsistence agriculture is primarily where you have low, or, uh, little little plots of land, but you have a lot of um, a lot of people to work it. Right, a lot of people to work it. Uh, generally, you're going to find this in more uh, higher populated areas. Again, developing third world nations. Then your extensive subsistence agriculture, large plots of land little uh, uh, amount, a little amount, small amounts of, um, of uh, labor, right, to work on that. I'm going to introduce you to a guy named John von Thunem, John von Thunem's economic models, uh, where von Thunem felt that uh, with certain plots of land, you could grow certain things, but you had to be near the markets in order to grow certain things. And the farther you got out from the market, uh, you would see uh, various types of production, uh, agricultural production. Uh, dairy products, and we'll get into this a little bit more, dairy products were uh, dairy farms would be closer to the, the agglomeration, the markets, and the farther you go out, uh, you know, less uh, in demand products, um, you know, livestock raising, grain farming, and so forth. More on that, uh, shortly. And then maximum sustainable yield. We'll, um, talk about that. Maximum sustainable yield. Basically, uh, whatever you're doing out there regarding, you know, gleaning from nature, if you're fishing, 
you know, don't overfish, right? Don't overfish to the point where you'll never be able to get back to the baseline of how many fish were there when you started doing that. And of course, we're talking about uh, commercial fishing, right? So, without any further delay on this, let's take a look at um, economic activities. And um, let's go right to the board here early on. Right off the bat. Let's see how I want to title this. Economic activity. Stages of production. You'll Well, you'll have that in your headings. You don't need me to write that up here. But economic activity. The uh, stages of production. The first of those primary activities. I'm going to sit down. Temptation is to... Stand up. Let's um, find my writing up here is a little less legible when I'm standing. So you have your primary activities. Harvest, spelled that wrong. Harvest, H A R V E S T.
Primary activities, these are activities that harvest or extract natural resources. Secondary activities, they add value to primary activities by providing form, uh, utility, some kind of form utility through processing and manufacturing. And then your tertiary activities, right? You're, you're talking about the service industry, uh, the, maybe the lower rungs of the service industry. You don't necessarily have to have higher education, right? Uh, activities that connect the producer and the consumer through wholesale and uh, and retail trade. Now, a couple of visuals uh, that you can check out, uh, you know, in accompanying uh, these uh, this section here uh, on um, Figure Nine Three, uh, page two fifty is a, a really nice visual there of um, the transition from primary activities to um, secondary activities. You have there, uh, in fact, I'll just read this here. Um, harvesting trees, you'll see that that on figure nine three is a primary activity, right? You can see the, the lumberjack and then uh, figure B, processing them into paper products uh, in the paper mill, right? is a secondary activity that increases their value by altering their form, right? The products of many secondary activities would be sheet steel from uh, sheet mills, for example, that constitute uh, raw materials, you know, the primary activities uh, for other manufacturers. to get into next um, some of the major well the major types of uh, economic systems let me just briefly uh, set this up your major types are your first one would be subsistence right subsistence where the goods and services are produced and consumed by generally the family of the producer then you have your commercial right commercial system Production is for competition, a competitive market. And then you have your planned economies, right? Where the production amounts and prices are administratively controlled, as in you know, past forms of communism. Uh, most national economies uh, involve some uh, mixture of these. And we'll talk about that in a minute, too, which you're going to probably find surprising. Break these down a little bit further. Three economic systems, the first, subsistence.
So in a subsistence economy, there's not much need for a market since what gets produced is consumed by the family uh, of the producer. I have one more to do here, the um, planned economy, but I think I'm going to run out of room. We'll just talk about these briefly and then um, I'll erase this and finish up this point here. Um, subsistence, uh, there's not much need for market since what gets produced is consumed by the family of the producer. Commercial, this is where production's for the competitive market, right? Producers market their goods for profit based off the law of supply and demand. I would add, too, that um, I don't even think it's arguable that um, this type of economy is the general rule around the globe uh, today. Some of you guys are straggling with this. I'll leave that up there and I'll, I'll, I'll put the last point here for this concept uh, up here. That's planned economies. Well, I guess I'll keep that up here as long as this fits. <clears throat>
clear for you now. Get some of this out of there. Feel a little bit like Bob Ross. Plan economies, government controls the price. They determine the economic questions, how much gets produced, for whom, and when, right? How much, for whom, and when. These are prevalent in communist societies. Again, a little economics here. Uh, for those of you who are um, I'm saying this all semester, off and on all semester, for those of you who are looking to get into uh, education, teaching. If you know geography, you can teach all the other social sciences because it really deals with all of it. As I'm sure you're seeing that as we go along uh, in the course. Now, just uh, kind of uh, add a little bit to um, this particular point here, major uh, types of economic systems. Um, and, and I said earlier, you're going to find, a lot of people find this surprising, but it's true. Uh, it, you'd be hard, hard pressed looking at our lecture model fills here. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find an economy that was purely one way or another, you know, purely planned, uh, purely free market, or even purely subsistent. And if some examples of that would be in China, right? Communist China. In communist China, that planned economy has been modified for free market structures. For free market structures. Uh, in India, farmers may uh, produce a lion's share of the produce for the family, but save some of it, right, for the purpose of selling. Uh, China, in fact, this is kind of a side note here. China, in fact, removed price controls on most, most food items. Uh, back in 1985, it was uh, May of 85 or whatever, somewhere in there, spring, summer of 85. So um, thinking back on this, most non-food uh, items uh, are thriving now. They were thriving since they did that. It just uh, laws of supply and demand now that they are being freed from government control. Uh, privately owned businesses are growing twice as fast in China uh, as the rest of the uh, economy. China would probably be, a lot of people get the term fascism uh, mixed up with a lot of things. Fascism is basically, uh, it's really not too much different than communism, but the government kind of takes its hands off of the private sector, I guess. They have a, a, a private sector that they know, you know, they can allow them to operate off profits and add, perform some kind of, a, provide some kind of incentive uh, for those individuals. And, you know, the economy kind of booms, but at the end of the day, the government kind of monitors and manages the private sector, right? Very different from uh, you know, United States and Western democracies that are more free market uh, oriented. Speaking of which, the United States, in the United States, a free market economy, you know, generally, uh, here, we're not purely free market in that the government places regulations on, you know, maybe some professional services, uh, the sale of alcohol, right? Uh, real estate transactions, et cetera, et cetera. You get the, you uh, get the picture. You see, I have figure nine, five here down. Yeah, figure nine, five, you may find interesting. Figure nine, five, uh, two contrasting views of income. And it's a map of basically wealth, right? Where the wealth is in terms in connection with what types of economies you have. And you'll see there, you know, the more liberalized your economies are, uh, the uh, the greater wealth, the, the wealth. And 
uh, figure 9-5 on page 252, uh, the, the uh, darker shades are um, where, uh, you know, you're, you have your, you know, your best economies, All right? So there you have that. I want to start moving next into uh, agriculture techniques. And uh, this section here will be some fills. And uh, I want to set this up before we get there, and then we'll break it down uh, even further. Um, agriculture is um, the most widespread primary activity uh, in the world, uh, occurring whenever uh, environmental conditions permit it, uh, subsistence, uh, agriculture, or what I'm going to talk about here, intensive or even extensive, implies nearly total uh, self-sufficiency. Kind of a side note with that, um, the, the Green Revolution, which some of you may have heard of, the Green Revolution um, has expanded yields uh, in some of these areas, generally developing nations, right? Talked about that earlier. Uh, so the Green Revolution expanded some of the agricultural yields of, but not the amount of farmed areas um, in um, you know, developing world regions. Uh, agriculture uh, in these areas in, uh, is a little different from your advanced economies, such as ours. Uh, in the advanced economies, we have a lot of specialization, right, because of, you know, we can afford... Um, up-to-date technologies, you know, off-farm sales and uh, reliance of, you know, controlled free markets to an extent. Uh, Green, Mar Green Revolution was um, uh, aided by, you know, Western technology for some of your poorer developed regions. And what that did was uh, it uh, provided seed management, um, and uh, generic improvements to seeds, um, disease-resistant seeds, um, fertilizers, disease-resistant fertilizers, and then with this, you'd have these, you know, you'd have high put, high input agriculture. Some of the negatives, there were some negatives to this too. Uh, irrigation and uh, irrigate some irrigation mismanagement. Uh, pesticides, right, spraying of pesticides, and uh, with Green Revolution, there was probably a loss of some uh, nutritional diversity, right, uh, along the way. But there you have that. And just break this down with the uh, fills that you see there. We'll talk first about extensive subsistence agriculture. Extensive subsistence agriculture. And with extensive subsistence agriculture, you have low population densities. Low population densities with low product output. Okay? So basically, you have minimal labor. Right? Minimal labor on uh, large areas of land. Then there's extensive intensive subsistence agriculture and kind of keep this certainly in your back burners of your minds here as I get as I talk about um, well, both of these concepts as we get to John von Thunem here in a few minutes intensive subsistence agriculture this is the use of small amounts of land with the employment of a large labor force right with the employment of a large labor force so population density is high in these areas, as are the yields produced, right? As are the yields. Now, there are several, several reasons for the various ways in which land is used in uh, warm, moist climates. First of all, there are locations where it's really not possible, it's really not possible to stay for extended periods of time. And therefore, nomadic herding is uh, the norm in these areas. 
And in those areas where the rheumatic, the pneumatic uh, uh, hurting is uh, prevalent, what they do there is they rotate fields. They rotate fields rather than the crops. And this is what they call uh, shifting cultivation. Shifting cultivation. And this is basically, the shifting cultivation is to, to maintain your productivity. Now, less than 5% of the world uh, actually does this type of cultivation. But when your population density is low and the technology is kind of absent, um, shifting cultivation is, is a prudent way, right? Prudent way uh, to adapt culturally. And uh, since there's not much land in comparison to the, uh, in, to the, to the population. On page 257, yes, 257, um, there's an inset map there of figure 911 of subsistence agriculture areas of the world. Uh, nomadic herding, uh, supporting relatively few people was you know, kind of the age old way of life in large part, large parts of the dry and cold world. Uh, shifting cultivation or Swidden cultivation, uh, another term for this. Uh, maintaining certal f uh, fertility by tested traditional practices in tropical, wet, and, and dry climates. Uh, and you can see by the inset map there, nomadic herding, uh, large parts of, parts of Asia support millions of people, right, engaged in uh, these sedentary intensive cultivation practices. Uh, basically what's being, you know, uh, cultivated there are rice and uh, wheat products, right? The chief, uh, the chief crops. And then you see some pictures there. Figure nine, twelve preparation of a Swidden plot of land in Liberia. Uh, first, the vegetation gets hacked down. Then the field is planted. Stumps and trees left in the clearing uh, will remain after the burn, which you see over on, you know, the after effects of this. Uh, over on figure uh, uh, B, right? Some, some Swidden plot of land in uh, Liberia. Some other names for this I met, just mentioned are Swidden or Slash and Burn, right? Slash and Burn, you may have heard of that. So you kind of burn up uh, in one area, burn up land in one area because the, you know, the bigger area is being used. And then the ground, you know, needs to follow um, after, you know, it needs to remain fallow after the second clearing. Kind of the idea behind that. One of my, yeah, one of my favorite sections in um, the course, and you guys know by now I really like this course. One of my favorites is uh, some of the early theories of of land use and one of my favorite theories of land use just looking at it uh, and uh, kind of wrapping my mind around the thoughts here uh, would be of John von Thunem and um, well you need visuals for a lot of this and some of you are going to need the visual of John von Thunem's land use model and thankfully your authors include that. They generally get it right. They generally get things right. Or sometimes I, I wonder, why don't you guys have this in the book? Uh, but this is one of them here. They, they get right. They include John von Thunem's uh, land use model in there. Uh, on over on page 264, figure 914, you can keep that open. I don't know if I'm going to, uh, I'm going to divest a lot of time into that. Um, visual there, but um, you guys will be able to see it, right, over on page 264. And looking at your fills here, Von Thunem's land use model. In the early 1800s, John Von Thunem, John Von Thunem um, developed this land use model, and it helps explain crop patterns by 
reference of uh, the costs of transportation and uh, land rent. So looking at the fills here, uh, in the early 1800s, John von Thunholm noticed that land was used for different purposes. And he looked at the land use as a set of rings, a set of rings around an urban center, right? And the rings consisted of the nearest ring, the nearest ring to the core. You know, the core would be the market, right? Your urban area. The nearest ring to the core is being used for perishable items, right? Perishable items that were high in demand, yet expensive to transport. Like the farther out, the farther out we get in these rings, you don't want to be transporting high perishable products like milk, right? Spoil and you know, you're going to be losing profits. Therefore, the land was of high value. Closer you get to the core, the high in demand materials or uh, products such as milk and vegetables be high in demand, right? High in demand, high value, land was of high value. The farmland farther out, and some of you guys are, you know, could be look, uh, will be looking at your visual there, page uh, 264. The um, logic was the farmland farther out consisted of less perishable items. Less perishable items. Lower demand, right? Lower demand and lower prices. Lower prices. So, the type of farming, the type of farming, you know, out on the, you know, perimeters, where it was of uh, maybe general and, uh, and grain farming, general and grain farming. The farther you get out, your third, fourth rings, and out on the edge, you know, out in the periphery of the ring was found livestock, livestock grazing. Livestock grazing. So, what von Thunholm concluded, von Thunholm concluded that the place of each ring was contingent also on the value of rent. It was contingent also on the value of rent. So, because those on the outer layers of the rings had higher transportation costs, right, took them longer and had farther to go, you know, your livestock grazers, the general farmers and grain farmers, you know, wasn't as much in demand. They had a lot, you know, a lot, a lot uh, farther to travel. The land value would be cheaper, right, to make it easier on them. The land value would be cheaper, you know, thus allowing a livestock grower, for instance, a, a chance to compete. Thus, the theory was dubbed Von Thunem's Rings. Von Thunem's Rings. Now, I had mentioned, uh, you know, a few moments ago on the last uh, concept about intensive subsistence farming and intensive uh, or ex uh, extensive subsistence farming. Intensive subsistence farming is where you have, you know, small plots of land and a lot, you know, a lot of people. So. Intensive farming would then take on high value and would have higher rent, right? Because the closer you get to the city, you're not going to have as much land to farm, right? The closer you get to the core areas, but you're going to have high demand, high demand products there, and you're going to have a lot more people to farm it, right? Because you're closer to the poor, to the uh, the cores. So intensive farming would then make take on a high value and would have higher would have a higher rent. So small uh, amounts of land with the employment of a large labor force. However, however, as the urban areas got bigger, got bigger, or multiplied, uh, this could change. Uh, von Thunem's theory 
uh, thus causing most of the agriculture to become intensive and, and um, high labor. Now, your lab for this week, uh, you'll, I'll be distributing some maps uh, to you, and uh, you'll be playing around with, you know, where farms are, you know, where farms are in Somerset County, and uh, how accurate was um, Von Thunem's theories, right? And um, yeah, I don't know if Somerset's big enough, to, the, the borough is big enough to consider that a, an urban area. We might look at Johnstown in connection to Johnstown and play around with that. So there you have it there, John Von Thunem's rings I, I like to, like I said I like these early economic theories we'll take a look at one uh, um, next time Alfred Weber uh, and where you uh, where we get to chapter 10 how uh, what's the optimum early economic theories for constructing plant locations right factories another cool um, study and then finally I want to take a look at uh, primary activities enlarge on that uh, a little bit more, and um, take one more set of notes here. We talk about primary activities. We're looking at you know primary 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 activities: forest, forestry, uh, fishing, uh, mining, and quarrying are other forms of you know primary activity, economic activity, and their acti their their development really depends uh, on the occurrence of uh, perceived resources and the technology that you, you know one has to uh, exploit them. Let's uh, turn our attention to that, and then I'll wrap it up here with the uh, the uh, lecture model, and uh, we'll call it a day here.
fishing a major primary activity because humans and animals are in need of fish for their diets. Thus, the demand uh, has increased. I think I could fit forestry on here. Forestry, another major one we'll focus on. So forestry is a major economic activity, uh, primary activity too, uh, in that, you know, forests cover one third of the, you know, the surface of the globe, it makes it a uh, formidable uh, primary, uh, a formidable um, component, right, for primary activities because there's so much of it. But ec ecologists and environmentalists are concerned. Uh, they, from what they think they see, they, they um, think they see a lot of widespread exploitation, um, you know, with, you know, commercial, you know, commercial lumbering industry, right? The usual suspect with these, um, with these concerns and, uh, and cattle ranching. And we're getting, what we're getting at here is uh, maximum sustainable yield.
So ecologists believe that <clears throat> maximum sustainable yield has actually been exceeded. That maximum usage, whether in the forests or out on the waters with fishing, has actually impaired renewability. We're not going to be able to get back to the baseline of, um, you know, where, you know, how many trees there were in certain areas or fish. Um, the good news maybe on the fishing front is, um, I'm, it was 1989, I believe it was, Exxon Valdez had a um, major oil spill. And uh, there was, um, well, obvious concerns about that. Whether you know, that oil spill would you know, impair renewability. Um, in the last 10 years or so, there was a study that um, found that the fish life up in the Puget Sound area, and we're talking about uh, off the coast of um, Washington State, right, Pacific Ocean. There was a study that found that the, the fish life actually pretty much uh, uh, funneled out to where it was at uh, before the, um, you know, before the oil spill. And of course, a lot of people were just, a lot of people were saying uh, in regard to this, that, you know, Mother Nature, and it kind of gets into the, uh, the global warming climate change thing, too, that some of you guys are looking at with your papers. Uh, it gets, gets into the argument that if you just leave Mother Nature alone, it will, you know, Mother Nature, you don't want to harm it, but it'll take care of itself. It's just much too big. It's been around so much more, lo uh, so much uh, longer than we have. So, there you have that um, maximum sustainable yield. Just kind of recapping, and we'll talk about uh, what's up ahead here. Uh, we looked at economic systems today, subsistence economic system, um, consumed and produced by the family, uh, commercial economic system, goods are you know, marketed for profit, planned economic system, government controls price. No economy, though, I said, though. No economy looks like it might be a good quiz question. Uh, no economy is purely one way or another, right? Types of agriculture. You have your extensive subsistence agriculture, low population densities and low product output, little labor on large areas, uh, intensive subsistence agriculture, large labor force, large labor force on small amounts of land, high population density, uh, high crop yields. Uh, shifting cultivation or slash and burn, Sweden cultivation, right? Warm, moist climates, uh, field rotation, nomadic farming, Asia, Africa, right? You guys have your visuals that I gave you. You can check out you know, in your books. Uh, let me see where we at next. Uh, John Von Thunem, right? John Von Thunem's rings. Uh, based off land use, right? There was a set of rings around an urban core uh, with, uh, you know, intensive subsistence, subsistence farming in those areas, um, contingent on the value of, uh, of rent, uh, high demand perishable items closer to the core, higher land rent value there, um, expensive to transport that stuff. And then you have your less perishable, lower demand items farther out, right? Lower rent value, higher transportation co uh, costs, right? Von Thunum's rings, known as Von Thunum's rings. And then fishing and forestry, you know, concerns there about, you know, being, you know, beyond renewability, right? The usage of it, basically called the maximum sustainable yield. Right, going beyond the baseline of wherever, you know, uh, being able to renew that. There's been so much fishing or forest, uh, foresting. So, what I'm going to do, uh, in case you didn't see it yet, there's a link uh, for, um, make sure you fill out your link. Uh, fill out your forms there, your, your worksheet on comprehension questions. I have comprehension questions to uh, accompany this. And then um, 
I will be in touch with you uh, sometime tomorrow uh, in regard to some practice material. And I think we're get, kind of getting these rhythms down. And uh, shortly, we're going to have to take a look at um, you know the final drafts. Uh, second week of April, we still got some time, I think, for that. If you guys have any questions on that, on that uh, you know, and my feedback that I gave you, feel free to get a hold of me. Right, you need to do that. And then uh, we have a quiz. We'll have a quiz week from week from today uh, on this. And if I'm forgetting any details, which might be the case, uh, I will get back to you guys. So um, until next time, I will um, see you again. And you guys have a great week. And uh, again, stay well in this uh, spring of, um, you know, uh, yeah, this uh, virus. So, all right. Bye-bye.